So, good afternoon. This is Tina here from the CIPD and this is a re-record of a webinar that took place on the 11th of March. We're re-recording because we encountered some technical difficulties with the record from that session. So for those of you that are watching this rather than just listening, please remember that it means that during this record, the poll and the chat functions are not available. I'll also be referring to a survey that was given to the participants of the last webinar and uh, making reference to that during our presentation today. So I'll be managing our time during this webinar and I'll shortly introduce you to my other guest speaker. Um, you will see that there's an email address at the end. Um, we'd love to hear from you on anything that we've spoken about today um, and any interest in ethics, whistleblowing and speak up. So getting us started, um, I'll introduce our next speaker. So, um, John Cunningham, um, who I will say hello shortly, he's a business development director at Protect. Um, so, John has spent 10 years working at St. John Ambulance in a variety of management and business development roles and joined Protect in 2012 as business development director. John has responsibility for Protect's work with organisations, helping them to improve their own whistleblowing arrangements. So John's going to be a fantastic contributor to our discussion today on whistleblowing and speak up. Do you want to say hello, John? Hi, everybody. Good to be here. And I'm Tina Russell. So um, I work at the CIPD in the Professional Conduct and Ethics Lead. I've been uh, working in the professional body field for 16 years now. Prior to that, I had a career in financial services. And at the CIPD, I've managed the chartered upgrading process in membership, CPD, and I also developed and implemented our academic membership route, which now has over 450 members. And for the last few years, I've been leading work on our code of conduct and on ethics. So in today's webinar, these are what we're going to be covering. So we're going to be going through speak up arrangements at other organisations, the benefits of speak up facilities, getting it wrong and getting it right, and um, looking at the ethical aspects and dilemmas to do speak up and whistleblowing, talking through successful implementation and a checklist and then covering questions that came up um, from the original webinar. So the uh, focus today is on the ethical aspects or dilemmas around speak up and whistleblowing. So um, last year the CIPD launched um, this report, Rotten Apples, Bad Barrels and Sticky Situations. And it's a review of um, academic literature that um, examines unethical workplace behaviour and looks at what influences ethical behaviour at work. The findings include um, things such as rotten apples, so the individual characteristics of how people behave, um, such as aspects of their personality or mood and how that can affect unethical practice. On an organisation level, so the bad barrels, it looked at um, organisation culture and climate and that they can influence unethical behaviour. Um, so, for example, putting profit above safety. And um, finally, in sticky situations, the aspects of jobs can impact ethical behaviour. So, for example, time pressure um, or isolated decision making. So the report highlights what can be done in the workplace to manage unethical behaviour and address the risks. So on an individual level, that could be that uh, where frustrated employees may be more likely to act unethically or fraudulently, how um, there is a need to role model positive management practices and moral leadership to really address counterproductive work behaviour. On an organisation level, um, how to establish an ethical climate. So looking at things like accountability through checks and balances of decision making and really honing in on isolated decision making. And on the situation level, um, looking at job design to redress uh, those areas of high pressure and time pressure. 
And to support this report, the CIPD launched last year the Ethics at Work and Employers Guide. Now, this guide um, calls on the nine action areas from the report and um, includes examples and case studies. It highlights red flags, uh, gives tips on what you can do to address those areas. So that includes some checklists, flowchart, for example, on how to develop and embed a code of ethics. And the topics covered in this guide are climate, code of ethics, fairness, personality and mood, job design, targets and reward, speak up, which we're covering today, accountability and communication. The guide also has a list of further resources for those that are interested in developing more um, on ethics. So as we said, today we're focusing on the topic from this guide, Speak Up. And at the CIPD, as with other professional bodies, we have a set of standards that feed our membership criteria and our qualifications. And our standards are known as the New Profession Map. And this was launched in 2018. And as with other professions, the map includes ethical behaviour. But there are lots of other areas within the standards, both on the knowledge requirements and on the behaviour requirements, where ethical aspects are called to the fore. So, um, for example, um, looking at how we have an expectation that unethical behaviour is called out and that colleagues are challenged, but how to do that in a positive and constructive way um, and an influential way. And to support these standards, not just with the membership and the qualifications, the CIPD has a suite of courses for members. They are free courses um, that can be accessed online um, and uh, they cover all of the areas in the map. And I'd particularly point people towards professional courage and influence because that's a key area of our standards as well as the ethical practice behaviour. And even in working in inclusively, that section actually has um, an inclusion on things about addressing um, people's and, and getting the range of diverse views and perspectives and how we expect our members and professionals to be open to getting that feedback and speak up is a great way to enable employee voice. What the guide picked up on is that unethical behaviour can cause absenteeism, tardiness, rule breaking, disengagement, defensiveness, it can increase attrition and it can cause withholding information. So it's really those matters and those areas that are very important to people managers and the people profession and why it's such an importance to the CIPD. This model here um, is borrowed from the Francis and Murphy book, Global Business Ethics, which is referenced at the end of these slides. And um, it's a, a useful model to provoke some discussion in organisations um, in looking at where do we see ourselves on this ethical scale. So it's the Rydenback and Robin 1991 model. And you'll see that at the top you have number five, ethical organisations. So that could be, for example, Tom's Shoes. And they're an organisation for every one pair of shoes that are sold, they give away um, another pair of shoes to areas um, that are impoverished and have so far given away 35 million shoes. So that's at uh, level five. And then you get to level one, a moral organisations. So that could be, uh, for example, organisations that are um, coercing people into new terms and conditions and not following ACAS guidelines or organisations that use bribes to procure business. And um, what we suggest is that it's possible for an organisation to use this model to identify where it probably sits and to aspire to obviously progress. Some may never shift 
and there are organisations that are constantly referred to in the media. Um, so, um, and there are some examples of, uh, for example, at number two, the legalistic. So this is where you focus on compliance with the law. Now, that may well be that, for example, um, in paying tax, you follow the uh, requirements and you follow according to the law, but not the spirit of the law and, and use that to perhaps not um, take an ethical position. And another example that's widely quoted is uh, the Ford Pinto. So that was a vehicle that Ford, um, actually the car met compliance standards, but it was prone to exploding. And unfortunately, some people had died uh, from that situation. So um, I mentioned at the beginning that we issued a survey to people who participated in the webinar. We had over 100 participants in our webinar, which was fantastic. And this question asks, which department has responsibility for speak-up arrangements in your organisation? So you will see here that at 50%, um, the outright winner um, is HR. Um, coming in second, and I'm glad to see that it's at least second, um, was the ethics department. And then after that, you have um, strategy and the senior leadership team or board and other at, um, you know, in a joint place at number three. Um, so, John, I don't know if you wanted to say anything on, on this, but um, <coughs> I would just add that, um, you know, for, from our perspective, um, in terms of speak up and, and whistleblowing facilities, um, where HR have that responsibility may actually contribute to people's confusion on what matters should actually be reported through these facilities um, because they're not intended to be, for example, an equivalent of a grievance process. And in fact, when um, you actually investigate reports that have been made, it may well be that there's a need for some disciplinary action, which is where, you know, the, the HR department would step in. So there's some real merit in actually separating this from the HR function. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, Tina. I think it's it's interesting to see the the clear winner there actually in HR with our client base, our business client base. Uh, we'd probably see some of the other areas a little bit higher than they are there, uh, including uh, internal audit, for example. But that might be more specifically about whistleblowing rather than a wider speak up. Yeah. Um, but I think you make some good points about HR um, there as well. Also, we see legal. And actually, the key thing is, um, you know, often one department will have day to day responsibility. But in fact, you know, a lot of these departments will have some involvement. Uh, and it's in all of those departments interests to, to be up to speed with with what the current arrangements are. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. So over to you, John. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Tina. So, um, really good to be here uh, and talking about how whistleblowing uh, sort of fits in with the wider speak up and ethics uh, scene. So, just um, to introduce who we are and what we do. So, Protect is a, a single issue charity set up uh, back in 1993, uh, and we focus purely on, on whistleblowing. Uh, and we do that in three key ways we support individuals through a confidential advice line and that's really at the heart of what we do and why our founder set us up all those, all those years ago and with that advice line <clears throat> the calls are under legal privilege uh, so the information doesn't go anywhere uh, without the express consent of the caller and what we're trying to do is is understand what the, the risk and the wrongdoing is uh, and give tailored advice on, on the individual situation to empower them uh, to, to make an informed decision what they want to do next. So it's an advice line, not a reporting line. Um, and our key, our key focus is, is helping that person get that concern raised effectively so it can be acted on with the right, uh, raised with the right person, uh, but also in a, in a way that's safe to do so for, for the caller. Uh, the other way we support uh, wider society is working with organizations uh, on their whistleblowing arrangements. And we do that through, through training. So it's training senior managers, training uh, line managers, uh, training staff in what whistleblowing is, and also providing consultancy services and really helping organizations embed and improve their, their arrangements. And then the third area of the, of the charity 
is our policy work, and, and that's campaigning for improved legislation. So uh, trying to improve the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which is the whistleblowing legislation, and also responding to individual sector consultations uh, around whistleblowing. Thanks, uh, John. The next slide, please, yeah, Tina. I think that's a really important um, So what, what do we mean by whistleblowing? Um, so this is our definition. Uh, different people do have have slightly different definitions, but you can see there it's it's a worker raising a concern about wrongdoing, risk or malpractice that affects others uh, with somebody in authority. And there's a few key phrases there. So one, it's it's about workers. Um, it's not about members of the public raising concerns. It's not about service users. Those people obviously have some serious concerns um, and it's important to raise them, but there are more appropriate channels for those. Workers are inside the organization that the the eyes and the ears of the organization and they'll come across wrongdoing but also risk there risk is a key word it, it doesn't have to be wrongdoing that's occurring it can be a risk of wrongdoing um, and it's important for organizations to encourage their workers to to raise those concerns so they can be acted on okay tina Great. Um, so another question that we asked in the survey before the webinar was what channels are offered in your organisation? And you'll see a range of channels there, which is not intended to be an exhaustive list. So um, number one um, in, in terms of responses here was um, an email address um, at 57 percent of the responses and then uh, next to that was a staff survey tool um, so that was considered a way that employees can speak up and then we next had um, direct to and the direct to to line managers um, or areas of concern and then after that was a telephone line so that's and that's quite lower in in the ranking from this survey um, and then after that was um, staff representatives, so having designated individuals in an organisation to whom people can raise concerns. And then lastly, at 7%, was having an app for Speak Up. Any comments on that, John? Um, yeah, just a couple, really. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting that uh, the highest one there was organisations having an email address, and that, that's very easy for people to set up or for the organization to set up. Um, I think some things to bear in mind there are, you know, a lot of staff might uh, be slightly wary of an email address, especially if it's, you know, speak up at or uh, whistle blowing at uh, or raise concerns at and, and thinking about, well, who, who's picking up this email? So wider communications are, are key, which I'll get onto a bit later. Um, and many organizations have have telephone lines, uh, either internal or external, uh, because people do often want to talk through their their, their concern with, with a you know with a human at the end of the line rather than just firing off an email. Yeah, and I, I thought it was a really important point that you made with the service that you provide for organisations mm -hmm. where you can offer a whistleblowing um, facility and that it has legal privilege, um, which is mm -hmm. a really good benefit for the workforce. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, the, the way, you know, we, we, we complement internal arrangements. So, you know, we don't say we are a replacement for anybody's internal arrangements. It, it's there in addition to those internal arrangements for those workers who, who might not be sure how or even whether to raise the, the concern they have. And we can talk them through that. Great. So over to you. Okay, so we've done, um, as I said, we focus purely on whistleblowing and um, do a lot of research uh, with, with individuals and also organisations. And I've got a couple of uh, slides here just, just highlighting some, some interesting statistics. So uh, a few years ago, we did some, some work with organisations um, with, with EY. And you can see there that, that the vast majority of organisations have have a whistleblowing uh, some sort of whistleblowing arrangements, and that's despite the fact there's no legal requirement across the board to to have arrangements or a policy in place. Some sectors require it, some regulators require it, but but in general terms, that there's no uh, broad requirement to to do so. But clearly, organisations feel feel they should at ninety three percent 
However, the flip side to that is, is less than half of UK workers are aware of their own policy. So it's really important that this isn't seen as a tick box exercise that, you know, we've got our whistleblowing policy in place and it's job done. You know, it's only as good as how many people are aware of it and, and trusted, which, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. And also the same the same people who are answering uh, those those questions said that one in three, uh, one in three of them responded saying, we've got arrangements, but we don't think they're very effective. Oh, sorry, one in three say they are ineffective. So only two in three say, say they're effective. And then the next um, sort of information really is is also of concern that uh, over half don't train designated contacts. So in, in policies, it'll often say, go and talk to your line manager first. And if not, then there are these other named contacts in, in the business to talk to. Uh, but a lot of those don't get trained on on receiving concerns. And that's really important because people, you know, when people go to, to raise a concern with somebody, they expect it to be handled in, in an effective way. Uh, and if the contacts aren't trained, then it's not a good um, reflection on the organization and the individual can well go silent at that point, which I'll, which I'll come back to. I think you mentioned, Tina, about the, the HR function and uh, perhaps confusion. And, and you can see there that 44% confused uh, whistleblowing, which is a wider public interest um, concern with uh, a private employment issue uh, such as grievance. So there's still a lot of confusion between the two. That There are grey areas in the middle, um, and we could, we could probably have a whole webinar on that. But, yes. but um it, it, again, it's important uh, in communications and, and in policy wording that, that it's very clear which channel is best for which type of concern. Uh, and then the last one, again, is, is really about, you know, the tone from the top and, and how important it is here for leaders in the organisation to, to promote this message that they do want to hear about concerns from their staff and that they will be looked after. And I would just, um, you know, to your point, John, also add that in, in my work, which is managing our code of professional conduct, we are the professional body for HR and, and learning and development. And um, people do try to bring complaints to us, a code of conduct complaints that are employment disputes. Um, mm. they're, they're trying to use us as an ACAS. Um, and I know yeah. that ACAS have, you know, certainly, um, you know, quite a number of, of cases going to them. So um, both highlight the real need that um, individuals aren't being able to, to deal with their matters or resolve their disputes at the organisation level. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, I just wanted to highlight um, um, when it, you're looking at ethics, there are um, a number of um, models and, and philosophy that you can weave in, but two particular schools that I wanted to highlight here. Um, so in the first case, utilitarianism, which um, is looking at the um, consequences of practices. So, um, you know, really looking at the impact on people's welfare and um, secondly, deontology, where there's a focus on rules and that uh, there may be a regard that any breach of a rule, um, however the degree, is a departure and therefore an ethical conduct. And I um, wanted to highlight both of those because I think they really need to be thought about at the organisation level in terms of the workforce and both could actually apply two areas of concern that individuals wish to raise um, so whether that's on a one-to-one um, -one level you know their experience in the workplace or even on the organization level or indeed the impact the organization is having outside so with its customers and with the community and so on and they're both areas to think about in terms of what you're accommodating in your speak-up facilities at an organization and a typical way that may be manifested is um, is information shared 
um, quite um, through an internal comms department or do you have a designated resource that is responsible for issuing, communi issuing communication on strategy um, and on business performance or is information only shared on a need-to-know basis, for example? And back to you, John. Okay, thanks. So uh, some of the benefits here, and, and and really I'd started writing these about whistleblowing and, and then we discussed it, obviously, Tina, and, and they do apply to, to wider speak up. Um, so, you know, looking at how be how whistlebl good whistleblowing and speak up arrangements benefit a number of, of stakeholders. So it can, of course, uh, and in no particular order here, um, it, it detects wrongdoing. It's an early warning flag and and workers are the eyes and ears of your organization they're the ones at the front line and they're the ones that are going to see or suspect wrongdoing that that you want to hear about it and if you've got the right culture where your staff feel able and comfortable speaking up knowing you'll support them and look after them then it helps you hear about wrongdoing at a, at a much earlier stage allowing you to act and, and stop the wrongdoing before it escalates into something else Second key benefit really is that it can also deter wrongdoing. If you've got that culture in place, then workers who may be tempted to, to do something m might hesitate because they know it'll be called out. So there's two key benefits there at the top. I think the other thing is um, for individuals, it, it helps managers. Often managers are just expected to know how to do this uh, without the training. And you know we're passionate about training managers uh, to to help them do their jobs effectively. And if the policy says go and talk to your line manager first, then they need to be trained in how to handle it effectively uh, for the benefit of the individual, but also the benefit of the organization. And if managers feel that they've been supported by uh, receiving uh, appropriate training, then, then, then that's another be benefit to them and the whole organization. Um, and then wider, if you've got this, this culture in place where staff feel able and comfortable speaking up and concerns are dealt with in, in an effective and appropriate way, then you are demonstrating internally, but also to external stakeholders as well, that you are an accountable and a listening organisation. Atina, do, do you want to pick up on some of the others at the, the bottom there? Yeah, and, and I would just add about how, um, you know, it's so vital for an organisation to make it clear that they do monitor ethical behaviour. And so um, whistleblowing speaker facilities offer that, um, you know, opportunity for people to highlight areas of concern um, and, and really reinforce the ethical climate that organisations should be aspiring to. Um, and, um, you know, the, there are corporate level interests here in terms of things like maybe um, some information that will feed into the risk register uh, will actually come. Mm. But um, yeah. you also have, for example, um, so an example that I, I referred to in, in the webinar was um, the US military uh, were using IEDs in Iraq um, and they were using Humvees. And um, there was a... Um, opportunity to replace those with what are known as MRAPs, which are mine resistant vehicles. And unfortunately, the process to get anything like that changed involved approvals at multiple levels, so multiple departments, including the Pentagon. So a delay in actually approving this um, unfortunately mm. led to unnecessary deaths and uh, someone actually whistle blew about that and, and it just highlighted mm -hmm. the circular impact of you know sometimes our processes even are not fit for purpose um, the layers of hierarchy and approval and you know that's something that gets referred to in the public sector for example you know layers of red tape um, and so you know this gives you the opportunity to call out the fit for purpose of processes or the chain of command and um, in mm. the ethics report that we referred to earlier, um, we talked about um, passivity. So people can be passive from happiness. You know, they're quite content in their job. They're, they're quite content with, um, you know, the organisation or from fear. But unfortunately, both of those can actually contribute to unethical behaviour. 
And ultimately, in terms of providing any form of facility, regardless of how many channels you provide, there's a real need to reinforce positive norms with staff Mm. and really give that sense of psychological safety. We want to hear from you and we want to put things right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then, if, you know, looking at the flip side to getting it right and wanting to get it right, you know, getting it wrong, the impacts can be huge. And, and you just alluded to one there, Tina, uh, where, you know, the extreme end of, of wrongdoing, either going undetected or ignored, uh, that, that lives can be lost. And, you know, if you think of people working in, in, in health or the care sector, uh, you know, that there have been some uh, examples in, in the news over, over the years on that. For example, mid-staffs where either people have uh, been too scared to speak up or spoken to the wrong people or it's been ignored, uh, then, then there are real impacts to patient safety, for example. Um, and since, I've, since I've been at Protect, uh, there have been a number of stories in the media in all sorts of sectors which which you know would fall into either one or, or multiple of the of these sort of uh, bullet points. So, you know, I work I work for a charity and I work in the charity sector and have done for quite a long time. Um, so the Oxfam scandal uh, a couple of years ago would would drop into a few of these. Uh, you know, the organisation itself um, was was in crisis mode. Uh, lives were impacted by the wrongdoing um, abroad. Um, a loss of public confidence in, in the charity itself, but also that that hit the wider sector. Um, and, and there has been a, a regulatory response by, by the Charity Commission, for example. Uh, other organisations such as Kids Company, uh, again, um, you know, a, a well-established uh, charity that, that was publicly well-known. Uh, so, that, that, you know, that was in the news a couple of years ago, um, but in other sectors as well. So, for example, the uh, the PPI mis-selling in the, the financial services sector, um, and uh, you know the banks had to put millions of pounds aside for for compensation, and then that has also led to um, you know the FCA introducing stronger rules around whistleblowing. So, um, you know, getting it wrong has huge impacts uh, at all levels for individuals, for the organisation, and for and for wider society. So. It's important to do everything you can as an organisation to to get it right, um, because at the you know at the heart of at the heart of this really is is the whistleblower and what 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 you know put yourself in their shoes. Essentially, a whistleblower or a, a staff member with a concern will will have three options. So the first option is is to keep their head down and, and keep quiet. And, and there are very human reasons why somebody might do that. For example, uh, nobody else in the team seems bothered. Uh, it's only a suspicion. They haven't got any evidence. Um, the policy messaging might not be very, very clear on what to do, so they might be confused. A classic example is is a fear, a fear of being ignored and not taken seriously, a fear of reprisal. Um, by the company or by co-workers uh, and a fear of impact on, on their job or indeed working in that sector again. So there are there are very human reasons why somebody might keep quiet, but of course this is the most dangerous uh, response because the, 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 the wrongdoing will, will go undetected uh, and the, the impact can be much bigger. Yes. So really, yeah, go ahead, Tina. Sorry, John. Um, I was going to just talk about some research by Edmondson that I found um, in 2018 where um, she highlights five beliefs about speak up at work. Um, Now, she calls them implicit theories of voice, but those five theories as to whether or not you do speak up and whistleblow at work include that you don't criticise work that might have been created by your boss, number one, that Mm. you don't speak up without solid evidence, number two, that you don't speak up if the boss is around, number three, that you don't speak up negatively in a group uh, format, and uh, lastly, that speaking up brings uh, negative career consequences. Sorry, John, do continue. Mm, no, I mean, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, we, we do a lot of research and, and you know, that, that strikes a, a chord. I think, you know, it's important, therefore, for organisations to, 
to realize and get their messaging right that you know it's not to, to counter those some of those points tina that it's not up to the the whistleblower to to have to go and get evidence that can put them in a dangerous position um you know you want to welcome somebody coming to you saying i suspect this is happening and, and that's enough we look into it and we'll, we'll we'll do what we can to find out if that is actually going on and we'll look after you through the process so you know that that's almost the flip side so if i talk about the other two options which is you know they can raise it internally with, with you as the employer or they can go outside and, and going outside you know people automatically think about the media but but actually uh, a lot of the time that's to the regulator very few people who call our advice line talk about wanting to go to the media for example so if i just look at that internal option you know it's really important that as an organization you know in your policy messaging and your your guidance that you might have on your internet and, and training and, and awareness sessions etc that it's clear how to raise a concern and who to go to and also that they will be looked after you know that assurance and reassurance uh can help counter some of those those um concerns they may have about their, their own safety or, or their own career etc um you know people will raise internally if they hear positive experiences of, of colleagues who've also who's who've also done it so you know who who might have raised a concern and it, it's gone well um the flip side of course is bad news travels fast so if it's handled badly then then word goes around um and that's why it's important that, that managers are trained so you know raising it internally is all about creating that culture it's it's staff being aware of the the channels and the processes in place and also crucially not just being aware but but trusting them um and going outside could be seen as well you know they, they either don't trust or aren't aware of the internal options or they might have a lot of faith in the regulator for example or they might have exhausted all the internal options if it's not being either handled very well or they're not hearing anything at all in, in other words no feedback they might then then go outside so some organizations we talk to feel that going outside is perhaps the the worst option for the organization whereas that actually i would say staff keeping silent is the most dangerous option all round uh for the organization but also for for the potential uh, escalation and impact yeah, and I would just add that um, there was some research by Trevino and Victor, which we referred to um, in 2004, and that showed that those who take principled stands or are willing to um, call out um, any concerns, whilst they are perceived as highly ethical, are also uh, perceived as unlikable. Um, and, and so that's mm. obviously an issue that's prevalent in the workplace. Um <sighs> Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's really important then, and, and this comes up, you know, uh, people who uh, are either perceived or worried about being perceived as unlikable. It, it's important for the organisation in in a, in a whistleblowing situation to to focus on the message, not the messenger. So, you know, I might be the sort of person who raises a lot of concerns. A lot, a lot may or may not be founded, but but this one may be. So, it's important to to take them all seriously and, and investigate fully. Uh, because this could be the one that, that that has some serious impact. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point about um, message and not the messenger. Um, and, you know, when an individual is um, considering whether or not to raise um, a, a dilemma, we've found that um, they will assess the rightness or the wrongness of the choices. Um, you know, they'll make an assessment of the consequences of each action. Um, but they do this by calling on their uh, personal norms that they've collected over their lifetime. And this is where organisations mm. can really work with um, employees um, on building that psychological safety that we, we spoke about earlier. Mm. So, okay. so moved on to the ethical aspects of yep. dilemmas. Yep. Um, so um, we talked about, um, we had looked at the ethical aspects and the dilemmas with regards to whistleblowing and speak up. And um, in the survey um, prior to the webinar, we'd asked people about the types of dilemmas that they've experienced. Um, and I know that some of these will resonate with the types of concerns that you've seen, John. But um, one of them that was raised um, quite a lot was 
about the issue of those that talk in proxy. So, you know, they're talking on behalf of someone without naming them or, um, you know, add to that the concerns that are raised anonymously. Um, now, that really um, brings a dilemma and, and a key aspect to the fore because it may limit the action that can be taken by the organisation. Um, for example, if bullying is referred to, um, you know, there may be a need to f- focus more on individuals um, and of course, you know, why are people doing that anonymously? Is it because there's a fear of retaliation? Um, and uh, there's some research that is referred to in our resources at the end of this uh, webinar um, by Dr. Chris Gill and Carolyn Hurst about the impact of being complained about. So the reference uh, that's listed is uh, some principles they developed because in their research they found that, for example, 71% of people um, who are in a role where there can be complaints raised reported a negative impact on their practice. And of course, there absolutely is an impact on their mental health and well-being. So um, Mm. the report gives some guidelines and principles on how to deal with those complaints. But, um, you know, there is a need to also look at at those that are um, referred to in the processes um, and a duty of care towards those employees as well. (coughs) And um, another issue that was raised was regards to uh, not having a speak-up facility at all, so lack of a a speak-up facility, which clearly Mm. don't support, um, but also the inappropriate use um, of the facility. So that might mean issues that are normal day-to-day matters that should be taken to HR, for example. Um, And then there was also an issue with regards to senior colleagues. So actually the ability of those that are working with the reporting function and how they can escalate those concerns. Mm, mm. um, You know, there's a real need to, um, you know, highlight that organisations have an identity that's greater than individual individuals and influential people in an organisation and that, um, you know, concerns and ideas as well should not be suppressed. Um, and even calling out conflicts of interest, um, you want to have that sense check on things that could be perceived as a conflict. So we recognise that um, you know our members are um, grappling with dilemmas regularly, and so the COPD have provided a facility uh, for members on our online community. So that's accessed via the COPD website, and that gives a confidential space where members can post anonymously um, if they want to thrash out and you know share a dilemma or concern that they're um, dealing with in the workplace and it's been a massive success we've had over 50,000 views of the area over 300 posts that have been made by members and what's really even more uh, inspiring is that the member community so it's not just the CIPD but the member community respond to those who, who put start threads and give not just technical support but emotional support um, mm. that, that's another aspect in you know the speak up provision is um you know giving that um emotional support as well yeah i think that's a really good point i think um you know having the channels and the procedures and the policies in place is is, is crucial uh, and pro- you know providing the the reassurance to workers to speak up because you know sometimes people might have been bottling this up for, for quite some time um before they have the courage to speak up and it can be a very emotional thing to do so i think that's a really good point about you know thinking about uh, staff well-being as well tina sure so uh, we asked in the survey um is your organization doing everything it can to encourage a speak up culture and you know this this graph speaks for itself really 60 percent of the respondents well over 60 percent said they could do better um, and so hopefully, uh, you know, some of the things that we've talked through today will help organisations think about that. And in the guide, we talk about the need to communicate regularly about the facility, not just have it, you know, that it's something that's a policy that sits hidden away um, and is also um, only uh, talked about at people's inductions. Uh, there is a need to communicate regularly, not just about the facility, but actually what action has been taken. Mm-hmm. Um, And we also asked what happens when um, a concern is raised 
Um, so you'll see here, um, and, and John, we spoke about this graph, um, you know, outside of the webinar because um, we were both surprised by the one that is ranked highest here, which is that the individual receives feedback. Um, mm. In my experience, that's not been the case. Um, but you'll also yeah. see that we've got things like um, reports to the senior leadership team, so the, the, those that are designated uh, with responsibility for the speak-up function will actually um, make those reports to the senior leadership team. Um, actually lower than that um, are reports to the board. Um, and higher than I expected was uh, that the workforce are given a general update. Um, mm. I don't know if that's because our participants of the webinar are people who are, who are working on this. And so, um, you know, maybe organisations that have already looked at this. Um, a smaller um, percentage had talked about all of these. And really the ideal would be that all of these are provided. But do you want to speak about any, anything to do with this, John? Um, well, I'd, I'd certainly echo your your surprise about uh, the individual receives feedback being so high uh, in our experience uh, from research of people calling our advice line that uh, a lot of people re report to us that they they haven't received any feedback at all. So that, that was certainly a surprise. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, on the flip side, the the smallest one there, but this, you know, all of these is is happening, uh, isn't a surprise that that is the smallest, especially when you think back to the previous slide of you know, a lot of people saying we we could do better, we could do more, and sure. I, and I think which is which is an absolutely uh, expected um, and and honest response from people to say well nobody's perfect, we we might have a lot in place, but we can all always do more, uh, and and keep keep pushing on to. To, to maintain where we are and get better. Yeah. Um, so just moving on then, um, you know, we talked about the impact of getting it wrong and, and trying to put yourself in, in an individual's shoes. Um, so, you know, <laughs> getting it right and how do you do that? And it, it's not easy when we don't pretend it's easy. Um, but what we say is if, if you're not doing these types of things, then staff aren't going to speak up so we, we've already touched on a lot of these actually which is you know it's important that the leadership shows leadership on this um and, and sends out very positive positive messages that you know speaking up and whistleblowing you know, raising concerns all, all the different terminology is is the right thing to do it is welcomed um and people do you know senior leadership do want to hear about these concerns but also crucially that that you will be looked after and I think you just touched on that, uh, the second one there, Tina, which is communicate regularly. A lot of the time, certainly in, in the whistleblowing field, uh, an organisation will, will maybe think, well, we're going to relaunch the whistleblowing policy and arrangements. We'll have a, 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 a comms campaign around that. Uh, and then and then that's it. And there might be a spike in, in, in volumes coming in and it might then tail off because another campaign about something else comes up and, and the day job takes over. So it's important to really keep keep communicating the arrangements are, are there and uh, the channels and the importance of this. Uh, but also, you know, the other reason to keep doing it regularly is to, to consider staff turnover. Um, and again, you mentioned uh, induction training. Uh, it's really important that people are are trained in 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 this uh, and are aware of the channels uh, when they join um, because that again from from other research we've done we know that uh, most whistleblowers for example uh, are, are relatively new in the organization uh, some of the others there talked about engaging with staff so a lot of organizations do wider engagement surveys uh, which is which is a great thing to do um, but sometimes uh, I think organisations could could include more questions around speaking up uh, and whistleblowing, uh, or do a standalone survey around that. Um, the others, you know, obviously, if you handle concerns effectively, then then people have a positive experience, uh, which which is what you're aiming for, and, and will speak up again if they have another concern. But that really links to the next point, which is training the managers to receive the concern well and in appropriate way. And and also not just be able to recognize, is this grievance, is this whistleblowing, et cetera, but, but also then knowing what the process is and what's expected of them as a manager. 
Um, and then the last one really is, and this is difficult with low volumes, but if you have enough volumes, then aggregating and, and showing that you're listening and acting on concerns by changing processes, et cetera, over the last 12 months or, or six months or whatever the time period is, is appropriate. And I would just add, uh, John, that um, in terms of competitive advantage, um, you know, I've seen more and more, um, particularly with corporate governance requirements, that, um, you know, whether there is a facility or not for staff and what are done about concerns is something mm -hmm. that organisations are um, asked about. Um, but also, actually, um, you know, for particularly our members who are concerned with employee engagement, um, you will have a workforce that are coming from organisations and there are some organisations that have fantastic facilities and fantastic arrangements. So if they're coming to your organisation and can see that, you know, that's not in place, that could really um, be damaging to employee engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we also asked about how facilities are promoted um, in the organisation. <laughs> And um, I won't talk to each of these responses here because I'm conscious of our time and, and, and to canter through. Um, but the thing is that um, as with uh, one of the earlier questions, we would also um, say that all of these should be looked at and not just uh, one in isolation. Um, you know, the mm. importance of tone from the top and messages from leaders is a given, uh, both on ethical practice but also on um, people's ability and feeling safe to speak up. Um, but all of these are so key in really reinforcing that facility and the value of it. Anything to add mm. before I move mm. on? No, no, I think, uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Okay, great. So we've got your site here, John. Yeah, yeah. So um, this visual just really calls together how we encourage organisations to look at their own whistleblowing arrangements, but, it, you know, you could apply that to a wider speak up uh, arrangement as well. So just to quickly talk through the three areas. So effective governance is really, you know, do you have a policy and procedure in place? Do you have that leadership we've just been talking about? Is it looked at regularly by, for example, the audit committee and reported on? Uh, in financial services? Do you have a whistleblowing champion in place? And that's actually a role that, that many other sectors are or individual organisations are, are putting in place, even though the regulator might not require it. Um, and generally, organisations might do better here because, as we know from the earlier research, that most organisations have a policy of, of some description. The engagement is, OK, have it, you know, you've got all that in place, but how are you engaging with with staff um, and that's all about the staff surveys and the communications and and, and trying to build that trust and uh, confidence and, and awareness in the arrangements but also how are you engaging with managers which, which I've talked about um, on some of the earlier slides in terms of helping them feel supported and knowing what's expected of them so uh, because let's not forget managers are also staff themselves <laughs> so um, so that's the engagement and the, the regular communications that you talked about, Tina. Um, and then the operations area is really, you know, what happens when it when it happens. So when when a concern is raised, how is it triaged? How is it received? How is it investigated? Um, what feedback is is given, uh, and and how is it resolved? So you know, you, you started off the the webinar by talking about your call to action, and and really this is our call to action for for those listening, but all organizations to to go back and look at your whistleblowing arrangements in this way to to see how effective they are. Indeed. And we asked, um, you know, about the provision of uh, a helpline um, and whether that's resourced internally, externally. Um, now, whilst mm. um, there were some that said not applicable, which is interesting, um, mm. obviously there were the, more than double those that um, provide it internally go externally. So anything to say on that? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I think the, the not, not applicable is, uh, was... was you know, a surprise uh, to be that high. Um, I think it's important that people do have some sort of helpline for, for staff who may or may not understand the process or not feel comfortable with the process. Uh, so that that was certainly a surprise. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting to see there is a combination. Um, and as I said, you know, we, 
we work with organisations to to complement those internal arrangements, and therefore we would probably fall into that that category uh, of the combination. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to talk to these two uh, slides here because they are both um, ones to for for um, listeners to refer to. But you will see that the first one talks about, and it's really just a flowchart, which again I've borrowed from the Francis and Murphy book, um, and the flowchart in terms of looking into reports that could be made. So um, the book uh, was referring specifically to ethical breaches, but I think you could actually use this as a flowchart in terms terms of uh, looking at how you deal with reports and concerns that are made through speak up facilities um, and then most importantly here is to really think about the flow and the process and the stages involved in communicating decisions because however effectively um, you promote your facility if people that use the facility are not getting any outcomes then you know you're going to have a real problem with um, its perceived value um, anything Think to add on those, John? No, no, thanks. Okay, so um, to, to bring it, um, you know, to wrap up, um, what we talked about um, are really looking at the barriers to speaking up um, and the need in terms of an ethical climate to create that openness. We talked about how um, you need to look at having more than one channel as well um, and building up that trust. And, you know, in thinking of the barriers uh, to speaking up, Bear in mind that you might have people who had a negative previous experience. So that's either at your organisation or where they've worked previously. Um, and we talked about inductions as a form of, um, you know, letting people know about your facilities. Um, I actually uh, was aware of an organisation where they had two PID um, over a, a group of people from another organisation and um, speak up as something that was introduced in inductions. However, with this group, because they were tupid over, they didn't have the traditional induction and um, some issues came to light, which actually you would have expected to have been reported through the speak up channels. And when um, one of our members looked into why, it was because they had never been made aware of those facilities um, and you know really looking at um, other in sources of information so not just the actual speak up and whistleblowing facilities but cross-referencing that with things like attrition rates the type of information that comes up in exit interviews looking at mm. quality and diversity rates of course health and safety stats as well um, and even mm. customer satisfaction scores all of these should be um, cross-referenced to the types of reports that are being made. Mm. And in terms of building trust in the organisation, um, a, a real need to um, show that you want to unpick any politics that are at, at play here because these can lead to unethical behaviour as well. Um, and as much as we want to be a principled organisation, and we might on that scale that I referred to earlier see ourselves as being at a four or a five, actually is that the reality of customers? Is that the reality of the workforce? Um, and showing that you may not always be able to take immediate action. So there is something here about managing the expectations of those who raise concerns. They may not see tangible outcomes immediately. Um, and, and that's something that I know has been raised um, in in multiple ways with regards to uh, the controversy around bullying and harassment. Um, so, for example, um, if HR are looking into bullying and harassment concerns in an organisation, whilst those inquiries are ongoing, they are confidential. And so, you know, it may not be possible to share that information or even when disciplinary action has been taken. It doesn't mean that the organisation hasn't actually taken um, any action. So there's a need to, to um, establish how you can communicate those concerns have been taken seriously uh, without actually breaching the confidentiality, confidentiality aspect. Um, and that is something that um, um, an inquiry at uh, government for which CIPD responded to, they uh, called out people hiding behind confidentiality um, and a need for more transparency. 
Mm. So um, in the guide, um, one of the things that's included is this checklist that can be used um, when uh, looking at your speak-up facilities. So the guide's in, uh, this, this checklist is in the guide, along with some narrative behind that. Um, but essentially, you know, the workforce need to know how to raise those concerns. They need the regular reminders. Um, but we also talk to things like looking at decision-making in the organisation. So it's not just about having decision-making frameworks, but actually having some transparent um, processes in place and being clear on what is and isn't acceptable. So, you know, when you're getting those reports raised, they are concerns, whether or not they actually relate to things that can be changed or there's some need to do some training with the workforce on things that are acceptable or not. And we also recommend that speak-up facilities are extended to contractors and agency workers. Um, so not just, you know, the traditional full-time employees. Um, we also uh, would uh, absolutely recommend that, um, you know, those targeted moral reminders, um, you know, they are looking at not just, um, you know, the reports that have been made, but the implications of those, how you can head them off and involving members of the workforce in reviewing those reports and concerns. And then actually that cross-reference to any policies in place in the organisation that hold people accountable. And um, we asked um, in the survey as well um, how um, effectiveness of facilities is evaluated and what came out was that an annual staff survey um, is one way that the facilities are evaluated um, but an excellent uh, suggestion which we would really uh, stand behind are external ethical audits. Um, and some organisations refer to having on their board a national guardian role as well. So those are things to think about. Um, but just bringing this to a close, I've, I've mentioned our resources. So these are some resources from the CIPD, including the guide and the report, the area for members to thrash out ethical dilemmas, um, and the CIPD profession map. Um, I also mentioned... Um, this global business ethics textbook and, and those are books that are available through our publisher but there's also here some case studies that you can um, obtain from Protect um, and some other resources in particular the Speak Up facility which is an app and a tool um, from the Institute of Business Ethics and the report that I referred to about being complained about. Um, we um, This webinar was part of a series of webinars for the CIPD. So this was the first one that took place on the 11th of March. The second one um, talked about fairness, which is a really topical subject um, and definitely related to ethical practice. And you'll be able to watch that webinar on the same link as this one. So the final webinar in the series is webinar three on the 30th of April, and that's looking at the action to prevent unethical behaviour in the workplace. Um, and John, we had some questions in the webinar that took place. Um, just because conscious of time, um, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. just mention two of those questions very quickly, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so yep, sure. One of them that had come in was about how many concerns should we receive based on our size? Mm -hmm. What's the <laughs> yeah good 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 question it, it's a kind of a how long's a piece of string question there's no you know we, we we say there's no right answer to that because you can have two organizations with the same headcount in the same sector with with vastly different volumes of concerns and you know the volume of concerns is influenced by all sorts of things you know the culture within the organization uh, the awareness the trust um, how well it's promoted um, it, it, for us, it's not about the volume. Of course, if you've got low volumes, that could mean there's not a lot of wrongdoing. Fantastic. Or it could mean there's a culture of silence and people are too too worried to speak up and a high volume can, can be the opposite. So it's about digging behind the, the volumes. What are they telling you? Is it certain types of concern? What about the anonymity rates? Um, also, you know, how many are... Um, substantiated all sorts of things you can be looking at behind the volumes but also you know i'd refer people back to that that diagram i i, I almost finished on in terms of that's how we would recommend people look at their arrangements and how how effective they are rather than judging it purely on on the volumes 
Sure, and I think that's a really good point about, um, you know, the the success of a speak up facility and arrangement isn't necessarily based on the volume, um, you know, mm. depending on, on other aspects in the organisation. And the second question was about um, how can I sell the need to resource speak up channels to our leadership team as this is not seen as a priority. Mm, mm, yeah, good question. Difficult one uh, for uh, people within our organisation to sell it sometimes. And I think it's it's pulling together a lot of elements from this webinar and, and yeah. demonstrating to the senior leadership that it's actually an investment rather than a cost. And it's an investment in staff, uh, but also the organisation itself. Um, you know, showing the benefits to the organisation in terms of uh, reduced risk, uh, there are bottom line uh, benefits in terms of you know um, stopping wrongdoing early, particularly if it's for example financial fraud. Um, benefits to staff about you know you touched on on staff well being. It can lead it can lead if you've got the right culture to reduce staff turnover, high productivity, etc. And it, so it's it's pulling all of those things together, uh, and and re because really it fits into how you want to act uh, and be seen to act as an organisation to to all your stakeholders. Yeah, and I would just add to that that, you know, there's an importance to say um, and clarify that you need to know the truth and that, you know, with managers and leaders, it, it might feel painful um, to hear some of the concerns that are raised, but you might learn something that you didn't perceive as oh, critical. Yeah. Um, and yeah, absolutely. And Managers need to understand the impact that they are having. You know, people management is not just about the technical aspects of the role. Um, and, and I would mm -hmm. really add, in, in wrapping up, that organisations need to honour, you know, the, the, it's one thing um, having a statement and a set of values, but actually to honour that commitment, um, you know, they need to know the truth and they need to praise the bravery and the courage of people who speak up rather than criticise. Okay, so um, these are the things that we're looking at in today's webinar, speak-up arrangements at other organisations, the benefits, getting it wrong and right. We've talked about ethical aspects and dilemmas and how to successfully implement those using a checklist. And we talked through some of the questions. I hope that all who are listening, whether it's through the audio or watching it on screen, have enjoyed this webinar today. Um, I'd particularly like to thank John for your time um, and also helping out with the record of this webinar um, so we're really Pleasure. grateful and you've made a fantastic contribution so thank you so much um, and well, thanks for uh, inviting me up, you're, you're very welcome so just to wrap up we um, have uh, a couple of opportunities that people if we've provoked you here in this webinar can get involved so one of them is um, to um, contribute to a bank of dilemmas um, that I'm working on which is going to um, lead to some case studies and some materials for members on the profession so we're really interested to hear about the types of ethical dilemma not just around speak up and whistleblowing um, but on ethics um, to, to help with that bank of case studies um, we also have uh, a couple of opportunities for people to volunteer and support our work on ethics and then there is going to be a follow-up survey um, and that's looking at other areas that you would like to see um, either covered in webinars from the CIPD or from any subsequent research and reports so that email address is there but please also use it for any aspect that has come up in today's webinar or any aspect on ethics at all we'd love to hear from you so thank you for your time that brings this webinar to a close and I'd encourage you to participate in webinar number three.